Alright, welcome to, um, another online lecture, yay. Alright, so, uh, um, let's see how good this goes. Um, I, I'm operating right now on, uh, virtually no sleep. Coming off of an illness. And, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. So, what are, what are we doing on this, uh, exciting video? Alright, uh, well... So we started looking into it on Wednesday, uh, and our plan uh, is to give a full-on classification of the behavior of this system right here. So we've gone two-dimensional, we have two unknown functions, x and y, with respect to t, and we're looking at a, at the situation where those are equal to linear equations, so uh, scaling and adding involving constants. Yay. All right, and as noted, it's probably best to rewrite this instead of a system of equations, but rather as one equation involving matrices and vectors, where uh, the matrix A is constant, involving A, B, C, and D, and the vector X involves our two unknown functions, so talking about its derivative is meaningful. Okay, so the first thing to note is that a fixed point for the system, right, would mean that uh, we need... Um, the derivative of x and derivative of y to equal zero. So on the left-hand side, we'd have to have zero. And whatever we plugged in, the, fun uh, the constants for x and c, would need to multiply a and equal zero. So we have a vector involving constants multiplying a. So any fixed point that could possibly exist is indeed an element of the null space. So this immediately tells us a couple of things. First of all, that um, there is always a fixed point present, the fixed point at the origin, zero, zero. <laughs> And second of all, since we are two-dimensional, if there are any others, it's either an entire uh, line of fixed points, or it's everything in the plane, which of course only happens if the matrix is zero, but right, if you're in that case, what the hell are you doing? All right, so that's pretty nice. And uh, moreover, as we noted, um, as we remember from differential equations, actually solving something that looks like this. Well, again, if we think about it for a moment, we have derivative is equal to constant times itself. Pretty natural guess is that something of the form e to the lambda t should be a solution. And indeed it is where lambda is an eigenvalue and v is an associated eigenvector. All right, beautiful. Okay, so again, remind ourselves that the eigenvalues for the matrix can be found via the following formulas, since we are in a the two-dimensional case, these are pretty easy to explicitly compute, and with reasonable formulas. So here tau represents the trace of the matrix, the sum of its diagonal entries, and the delta represents the determinant, which is, of course, in the two by two case, a very easy formula uh, to write out. Um, yes, um, so it's worth noting now, right now with 2D, we are gonna talk about 3D eventually, but um, if I remember correctly, there is no like meaningful classification um, in 3D as there is for 2D. As you can imagine, right, in 2D, we have trace and determinant. Um, for 3D, right, you've got a third order polynomial, and then, um, so trace and determinant are still there. The determinant's the constant term, the trace is the term attached to linear, uh, the uh, the quadratic part. Uh, but the term attached to linear is like some weird, um, if you know anything about symmetric polynomials, um, then it's, it involves that. But, um, yeah. Anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so it doesn't really feel like there is a one. I don't remember a third one. I remember it was very. Uh, uh, and when I took this class in grad school, we got to a, uh, there was an exam problem. It was a it was a three by three linear, and we were asked to classify the fixed point. So I just did this, like completely forgetting that it was only for two D. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, that that's why I vaguely remember there not being like an analog of this to higher order dimensions. But um, anyway, all right. So uh, one of the main things to note about uh, the eigenvalues, how they relate to tau and delta, not only do tau and delta tell you what the eigenvalues are, the eigenvalues also tell you information about tau. The sum of your eigenvalues must be the trace, and the uh, product of them must be the determinant. And that's worth knowing these formulas do um, extend beyond uh, the 2 by 2 case. All right. So, all right. Uh, to do the full classification, basically, then we only really need to focus on these uh, two quantities right here. So it turns out that um, depending on what this is doing, um, we're going to be able to more or less determine all the possibilities. So the the, the determinant actually ends up um, just describing everything essentially. So note the determinant is a real number. Right, uh, the eigenvalues may be complex. It's possible for that to happen, but this will always be a real number. Right. Okay, so if it's a real number, that means there are just three possibilities for us to consider. The first one is, when is it negative? Okay, 
All right, now if you have that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are complex numbers, um, they have to come in a conjugate pair, right? And that just, again, comes from the formula, and hopefully as you vaguely remember about complex numbers, how that works. Um, but then the product of lambda 1 and lambda 2 would be a non-negative real number, but that contradicts our uh, hypothesis here. So note, this reveals to us that if we do have complex, we're only going to see that when uh, the determinant is non-negative. If the determinant is negative, no complex numbers. So it's got to be that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are real numbers, and furthermore, they must be distinct, and uh, they must have opposite signs. Beautiful. Note, they have to be distinct, because if they were the same, the product here would be non-negative. Um, and moreover, their signs need to be opposite. <clears throat> right? They cannot have the same uh, sign. Right? Otherwise, uh, we're not going to get the product to be negative. Okay, so that means that... Um, Right, we have two solutions that these are generating then, since they are distinct. Um, one of them is a positive real number, and one is a negative, so one of them will go to zero, and the other one will explode. Um, so in other words, we have a saddle point. All right, and let's uh, look at an example. So here is a nice uh, system of equations. The determinant is negative four, and uh, the eigenvalues are uh, four and negative one. Okay, and again, it's worth stressing that uh, in some cases, the eigenvectors are very useful and they um, tell us a little bit more about how the solution is going to behave. So, in this situation here, so here is the uh, vector um, field that I plotted, and I also plotted two lines. All right, so note uh, the blue line is corresponding to uh, V2 and the red line is corresponding to V1. Right, so note on V2, that is the eigen vector, uh, the eigen subspace, the collection of all possible eigenvectors, associated with our negative eigenvalue. Okay, so that, as we can see with the arrows, it means we are seeing the decreasing. You note that if you're on the eigen subspace, then you're stuck on it, right, because our matrix will, oh, you gave me an eigenvalue, I'll spit out a scalar multiple of it, so any solution, uh, any, uh, any set of solutions x and y whose trajectory is on this line is stuck on it, and note that they crush right down to zero. Likewise, same thing is true if you are on uh, red, which is the eigen subspace associated with the positive eigenvalue. If you're stuck on it, you're on it, and note that you're blowing away. Now we can see the overall behavior. So if you're not on either of these two, so for example, if you're here, all right, well, nearby, right, this is telling you to crush down, but once you start getting close enough to X, it's telling you to push away, right? So in this range, right, if you're over here, you're starting to get pushed down, but eventually this influences you and blows you away. Likewise, if you're over here, so you can influence and blow away, influence and blow away, influence and blow away. Beautiful. All right, and uh, that's the story. So note, um, for this situation, actually getting the eigenvectors gives us, uh, you know, some pair of lines to work with, and right, and again, lets us sort of cut up the plane into segments and talk about the uh, stability. It's beautiful. Okay. All right, next case is when the product is equal to zero. Now note, this could only happen if one of them was zero. We can't multiply two real numbers and get zero and not have either of them be zero. All right. So uh, this, of course, means that our matrix is not invertible, um, and so its null space has stuff in it other than the zero vector. So in other words, there is a line of fixed points, or, oh wow, why is there no space there? Oh, because I didn't put up space with the pause. Um, uh, or it's the whole plane, if you're looking at uh, my derivatives are equal to zero. All right, so anyway, here is a, a quick example of this. Um, and again, note that uh, in order for the matrix to be non-invertible, these two equations have to be linearly dependent, so they have to be scalar multiples of each other. Um, and from this, right, any fixed point uh, would have to satisfy this is equal to zero, so the line that will generate this will be y is equal to one half times x. And there it is. Ooh, uh, so everything on this line is a fixed point, but everything that's off of it, note, if you're below, um, the line, uh, then the derivative will be positive, so the slopes are going to be pointing up, and if you're above it, then the derivative will be negative, so we will be decaying. We very fun. Okay. All right. So that was the case of the determinant being negative. Uh, this was the, uh, so we just talked about the case of the determinant being negative. Here's the case where the term is zero, and as we see, there's a whole line of fixed points. Um, and if you're above, and depending on how the equations are set up, if you're above or below, you're going to um, either 
uh, follow the line up or follow the line down. All right, so with that said, now it's time to actually get into the juicy case, the case where a bunch of stuff is going down, and that's where the determinant is positive. Okay. All right, now at this point, we actually need to consider the other key ingredient, which is tau minus 4 uh, times the determinant. Uh, right, because the determinant would be positive, right, well, it's very possible that our, matrix, our eigenvalues are complex, it's possible they are both negative, it's possible they're both positive, right, so there's, there's quite a few cases to break down, and it turns out tau squared minus 4 delta is the right thing to look at. All right. Okay, so if that's positive as well, then uh, there are two distinct real eigenvalues, and um, they will have to have the same sign. So they have to either both be positive or they have to both be negative, right? They can't be alternating, otherwise this will not be positive. All right, so this is positive, so we have two distinct real, um, and they have the same sign. And note that the sign, then, can be determined by looking at, uh, if we go back all the way over here to the solutions, so this is positive, and if this is positive, and I know they're both positive, right, then I know that both of them are positive. Okay. So uh, the tau determines what happens there. So if tau is positive, then the eigenvalues are positive, so the solutions are going to grow. And in this case, we have an unstable node, um, or an unstable saddle node, um, which is the other way of saying it. Um, I did notice that uh, our textbook, right, so initially they talk about this as like a saddle node, um, and, give, and it gives like a real flimsy excuse for why you would call it that. Um, and then he like, <laughs> and then it just abandons it, like almost immediately. It's so weird. I remember this now when I taught this course last summer. I'm like, oh yeah, why, why do you even do that? He starts, he starts calling them nodes now. He doesn't even care about saddle. <laughs> he's on, he's on the, uh, he's on the chaos. Alright, um, so if tau is negative, um, then it's got to be that the eigenvalues uh, themselves are also uh, negative. So again, remember their sum uh, is equal to uh, tau, and if that has gone uh, negative, right, it's got to be that they're both negative, right? They have to have uh, the same sign. Um, in order for this to work, um, and if that's negative, well, like, if they were both positive, that can't happen. So it's got to be that they're both negative um, in the case when tau is zero, uh, less than zero, so the eigenvalues are negative, and the solutions decay. And so then, um, right, we're going to head towards the origin, so we call this a stable node. And it's worth stressing that tau equals zero cannot happen, because that would mean this was not uh, negative. So, in this situation, it's got to be that we are either having solutions that are uh, blowing away from the origin, so having an unstable node, or solutions that are heading towards them, a stable node. Okay, so for example, if we're in this uh, case right here, um, which should look familiar as the one we saw in class, um, the eigenvalues of vectors as we computed are as follows, and um, now we actually have the picture with the lines this time, because uh, I... Um, uh, actually did this in Sage, but I had to use the Sage... Um, like free online compiler, which like takes forever to do anything, um, and so which is why I haven't been using that in class. Uh, but anyway, um, we got this picture right here, and so again, you see if you're on the line, you're on the eigenspace. Um, this one is the one corresponding to positive, so you're growing away. Oh, they're both positive, sorry. Uh, but this is the um, uh, the weaker one, right? Uh, that's uh, no, that's the stronger one. Sorry, Blah, I'm smoking. Uh, that math right now. Yeah, so that is the more powerful one. This is the weaker one. Uh, oh, yeah, no, so yeah, this is the weaker one. What am, I, what am I talking about? Yeah, this is the weaker one, and this is the more powerful one. So when you're in between, you can't really see it, but it is going to be a little more attracted to the blue. But when you're out here, you really see it, because this one's weaker. It's still pushing you away, but no, the influence of blue, even though it's all the way down over here, it's still pulling it towards it, because this is a magnitude stronger than this one. So it will actually pull it back over. Likewise, it will pull it back over, and if we're in here, um, if we blew this out even further, we would see that it kind of eventually goes away from this, even though it still kind of does pull it. The blue line is a lot stronger than the red one. Okay. All right, no, this is unstable because our eigenvalues are all positive, so we're blowing away. All right, next up is um, probably probably the, the, the most interesting case, which is where the delta is positive, but the uh, discriminant of the polynomial is zero, so there is precisely one eigenvalue. But in the situation, as you hopefully remember, um, you can have one eigenvalue, but there could be multiple eigenvectors associated with it. 
In the 2x2 two two case, it's not super interesting. Um, in 3x3 three three and higher, it gets a little spicier. But in the 2x2, uh, two two, basically there's two possibilities. Um, if there are two linearly independent eigenvalues, then every non-zero vector is an eigenvector. So any solution, any trajectory is just stuck on a line going for the origin. It can't, it can't be anywhere else. Everything's an eigenvector one way or the other for the matrix. So if you're anywhere, you're going to be on a line, and that line goes for the origin. And so um, basically the only thing that could possibly exist, the only trajectories that are possible, are lines going for the origin. And again, the uh, stability of this stuff will be determined by tau. If tau is positive, then our only eigenvalue must be positive. So we will be unstable, the solutions will grow. Um, likewise, if tau is negative, our only eigenvalue is negative, and the solutions will decay. Okay, so um, we call this a start node because of the shape it will form, because it's just lines shooting out of the origin. Um, and again, we're stressing tau equals zero is not possible. If it was the zeros out, that means the determinant zero, but we are assuming that's not the case. All right, the other case, and we'll look at both of these in a moment, is if there's only one eigenvector. And um, this is referred to as a degenerate node because it kind of looks like a node, but there's only one eigenvalue. So there aren't two eigen, there's only one eigenvector. So there's not, there isn't two eigenvectors that are um, where one is like a weaker one and one's a stronger one. There's only ever one. So the shape for it is not quite the same as you see in a, in a typical node where you have two eigenvectors that are competing, um, where one is more dominant than the other. Here we'll just have one. So only it will be influencing it. So the shape looks uh, quite different. And again, the stability is uh, based off of uh, the tau, uh, because uh, we only have one eigenvalue, so tau is just literally equal to um, uh, uh, the, um, the, yeah, so the trace, right, in this case would be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues, um, and then so in this case, right, it just lines up, and we're happy about it. So again, if it's positive, we are unstable, and if it's negative, we are stable. Okay, and again, tau equals zero cannot happen, because if it was, then delta would be zero. Okay, so uh, here's a really boring one, and we kind of talked about this, right? This is an uncoupled system. There is precisely one eigenvalue, and any non-zero vector in R2 is an eigenvector, so it's an unstable star node. So just, there you go. It's just straight lines shooting out of the origin. Um, and I think I should have plotted a line so you can kind of see it. Uh, wherever you draw a line, it's going to go through the arrows they got there. But, yep, that's it. Uh, but the more interesting case, uh, right, because, again, we saw this when we were talking about that uncoupled system last time. Um, this situation is a lot more exciting because here we've got uh, lambdas negative 1 is the only eigenvalue for this uh, matrix, and the only vector is 1, 0. Okay, so if we plot this now, um, right. So everything's going to be attracted, uh, basically, to this line, right? Since we are negative, everything's decaying, so it's heading toward the origin. But note, the only influence is this eigenvector right here. There is no other eigenvector influencing it. So if you're on the line, you just shoot straight towards the origin, that's it. But if you're off the line, note wherever you are, you're going to get attracted to uh, the line. So wherever you are, you'll just start heading towards it. We and note, it's kind of spirally it's there's a kind of a spiral to it but not really right because it won't ever oscillate um but it's worth noting the shape is quite interesting where like this is the influencing factor but wherever you are you're getting influenced by it so if you're here you're just kind of going with it if you're up over here you're getting influenced but no you're not getting pushed straight towards it um right which is quite uh quite interesting right because you're not stuck on uh, lines there's only the one fixed point you're actually being attracted to so this is pulling this way and this is pulling this way so if you're here you're getting pulled but right you're kind of getting pulled by both so you're not just instantly going straight to it this is pulling you here but that's getting some influence too so you are kind of seeing that you get um uh, over you, you right you're trying to get to the origin but you're not uh, you're being influenced by both this piece and that one and they both um, right have an equal amount of pull so you're not just going straight in you're getting influenced by both which is quite neat um, and if you're looking at it going like hey I think there might be like another line here um, if I remember correctly I don't think Stratz goes into this but if you get the generalized eigenvalue um, I think that is what you can use to plot it out um, and if you plot that you see them that might be it kind of explaining this sort of like this this thing that kind of feels like a line right there but 
beyond what we really need. What we're really caring about is like a, just a general classification right now. All right, and now for the final case, uh, what happens when the delta is positive and uh, this is negative? Well, then we get a pair, conjugate pair of complex roots, and they specifically will look like this. So I is joined to the party. Um, note this is negative, so in order to talk about its square root, we got to flip it. All right, and then there's the formula for it. And once more, um, recall that e to the uh, complex number breaks into this by Euler's formula. So uh, this right here being the real part of the eigenvalues, the presence of an exponential will be dependent upon uh, the trace tau showing up. Um, the uh, imaginary part is going to show up here in the uh, cosine and sine part, but that's just going to give us the oscillatory behavior. So because trig terms are not going to show up, uh, our solutions will be uh, spiraling around, and depending on uh, the stability, tau is going to tell us what's happening. Again, if tau is positive, that means this term would be positive, so we will be unstable. If tau is negative, this will be uh, negative, so this will decrease, so we'll have a stable spiral. And if tau is equal to zero, there is no exponential term. So wherever we are, because there's no exponential, there is no growth. There is no decay, so we will just circle. All right, but as we're going to see, it's not going to be a true circle. All right. So, all right, uh, here's an example uh, where we have uh, complex eigenvalues, and the real term is positive, so that means the exponential terms are pushing us away, so we, we spiral. Ooh. So we've got an unstable spiral, but uh, for now the case of a center, so here is a system, uh, 2 minus uh, yx, and, and that's supposed to be a derivative right there. Um, let me just fix that. We're almost done here. All right. And uh, here we've got uh, a purely imaginary real number. So note that's the only way you could, uh, excuse me, that you would get a center. <laughs> just perfect. Have you ever listened to, side note, uh, since we're at the end here, uh, there was a video recording, oh, no, a video, re there's an audio recording of President Lyndon Baines Johnson um, talking to a tailor about uh, these pants that he wants. Um, and it's like the funniest thing in the world because like he's talking to this guy and he's like I need these pants for my my big presidential wiener <laughs> And he needs up enough space for his butthole. He literally says butthole It's so funny. And he like burps in the middle of the sentence. And he just keeps going. It's so funny So check it out. It's like LBJ orders pants or something like that. It's, it's a hysterical video <laughs> but Anyway Um so yeah, uh, the, um, since we are a purely imaginary um, complex, uh, we will have, uh, wherever you are, you're stuck uh, just oscillating, but it's worth noting that um, even though it will oscillate, it will not necessarily be a circle. It could be, as we see here, an ellipse. Ooh. And um, right, uh, right, so no, it's not perfectly circular. It's tilted, and it's not, you know, you know it's crushed a little bit. Um, so there is a way... Again, if you're very interested in this, there is a way to get the minor and major axis for the ellipse here, and it comes from um, getting the associated eigen um, vector, uh, but note it'll be complex, so then you split into its real and imaginary parts. And if I remember correctly, the real part, it, it, the, bigger, uh, the bigger one in magnitude is the major axis, and the smaller one is the minor axis. Um, so again, if you're really into ellipses. Um, also, a side note on ellipses, if, um, I, I, I never realized this until I saw it on the math subreddit. Um, there is no good formula for the circumference of an ellipse, uh, which is <laughs> infuriating when you think about it, I guess. Um, but anyway. All right, cool. All right, and then we got a center. So again, um, again uh, if you want to break down you know, some more information here, you can extract a little bit more out of the eigenvectors. But for our purposes, we just want this nice full-on classification because now that we know how every linear system's fixed point at the origin is going to behave, what are we going to talk about next? Well, what about fixed points of 0, 0 of a nonlinear system? Can they exhibit behavior other than what we've seen here? Can we have something other than saddle points? Can we have something other than star and degenerate nodes? Okay, so the other nodes, can we have oscillatory behavior, but we don't really have nice little circles or we don't have nice little spirals? So in the nonlinear case, what changes? What's different? And that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, and spoilers, initially it's going to be, how do you make it linear? All right, so see you on Monday. <laughs>